Good morning, everyone. My name is Todd Cochran, and I want to welcome you to the Saturday Morning Tech Show. And we have no one up on top, and we have Rob on the bottom. Rob, good morning. How are you? Okay, good morning. It's great oh. to be here. Well, I tell you, we've got all kinds of stuff. Uh, we're kind of wired up this today to do a, to, uh, do a multitude of things. And uh, I've got a Hangout started on Google. And uh, to date, uh, well, we hadn't planned on doing a Hangout because we didn't get a lot of response from the TPN guys. But uh, it's ready to rock and roll if someone jumps in there. So if you're uh, following me on Google Plus, just go over to uh, my Google profile, and uh, you can you can join the hangout. Don't know if you can hear that clickety clack in the background, but my my dog is walking around on the wood floors out there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, got uh, a bunch of stuff to go through today. We were supposed to have Jeffrey Powers in, but uh, I don't know if he uh, if he overslept or or what happened. But uh, irregardless, it's. It's you and me this morning, but we've got all kinds of multitudes of connections. Rob, I can uh, we can bring up the uh, I get the overhead to cam look now. So we got a new look in the background there. We've got the Chrome wow. OS turned on. So if we want to uh, show off Chrome, we can we can do that. And I have got it so I can uh, I can scale the screen now. So that's uh, that's a major thing. <laughs> and then of course we can whoops. What what do we have there? We don't have nothing there, so obviously we have a black screen there. But so are you doing a go ahead. Chrome show today? Are you doing a Chrome show today? Uh, not uh, well, yeah. Plan on doing one a little later. So little, little uh, later. yeah, so that will be uh, um, I, I normally what I'm doing right now is I'm just recording that and then uh, restreaming later because of the uh. There's a little bit of logistics on that one. I haven't completely got where I feel comfortable being live. And the uh, part of the challenge is right now is, you know, the crook. Yeah, you know, I'm a little bit worried about the sustainability. I guess we can make that as our first topic. Let me change something here. Wow, that's interesting. I guess I killed that. Yeah, the uh, I'm a little worried about the long-term sustainability of. Well, that's that sucks. I'm worried about the long-term sustainability of the Chrome Show because it. Uh, you know, I thought there was all these you know cool, cool plugins and apps, and what I'm finding is is I'm loading an app or a plugin, a supposed app, and when I double-click the app to launch it in. Uh, in Chrome, all that really happens is that I get um, uh, essentially a a web page. I'm not getting anything special, you know. I guess I got lucky on the first two or three, you know, apps that I loaded. They were really truly apps that worked within the browser. It was a different experience, but this is not at all what I'm seeing um, in the system at all. So. I don't know what that, I guess that doesn't bode well for the uh, long-term viability of the uh, of the Chrome show. Because, you know, if I don't have a good, uh, oh, I know what I did. <laughs> That's why I don't have that network connection. All right, let me, I, I induced my own problem here. I'm thinking, why did, uh, why did I lose a screen over there? <laughs> All right, let's, let's change this. Oh boy. Well, you know, what the problem is here in the in the studio is because I don't have enough single string bandwidth, I have three internet connections in this room and they're all on their own network. So it's not like I can have all machines on all three networks at once. <laughs> yeah. So if I could yeah, I heard on your your regular show that you had a a big bill come back for getting a five meg pipe into the house. Really? It was like eight hundred bucks or something well, like that. Well, I caught, I priced it out to find out how much it would be, and they came back and said, "Oh yeah, we can upgrade you to a to a five meg up pipe. Uh, that'll be eight hundred bucks, eight hundred and twenty five dollars a month, and you have to sign up for a one year term. If you decide that you want to get a two year term." Um, you can, uh, we'll, we'll knock it down to seven seventy five. <clears throat> Such a deal. 
such a deal. Yeah. But um, the only way they can really guarantee five megs here in Hawaii is bring fiber to the studio. So he said, well, if you want uh, a full five megs, we're going to have to price out the build out. In other words, how lo- how far are you away from the next fiber node and how, mo- how long is it going to take to uh, get it to your house? He said that could be as low as $1,000 or it could be as high as $50,000 to bring fiber to the studio. And... Wow. Well, it's fiber, right? Yeah, in at at eight hundred and twenty five dollars a month. Yeah, well, and uh, you have to pay for uh, connectivity, I guess. That's it's the same thing, I think, to a certain degree here, because mo- most of our bandwidth is all down speed. Right. It's there's really not a lot up speed, and if you want to get fast up speed and down speed, it's the asynchronous stuff. Uh, you, you do have to pay through the nose for that. Well, you look at what residential's getting. And residential's getting, you know, I'm hearing guys on Fios, on their yeah. regular cable modems, they're getting three, four, five megs up, you know, and yeah. 20 megs down. Um, yeah. You know, we can get 12 megs down here, but uh, the DSL does better for up than it does for, than my cable modem does. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's D- interesting. it is. On my cable, I can get about 650, 700 consistently. But on my DSL, I can get a, I can get at least a, a meg on my DSL. But my DSL yeah, down, sure. <laughs> my DSL down, I only get three. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sure there's just a huge amount of profit in there too. Oh, so, yeah. bandwidth is only getting cheaper in the bigger scheme of things. If you look at the the wholesale level, right? It's not, uh, it shouldn't be that expensive. But it's, it's the same thing. I think it's that's really going on with the. The whole wireless operators too, right? You know, with mobile phones, mm-hmm. you know, with these tiered tiered pricing plans, it's all about uh, margin and profit. They're trying to maintain their their margin and profit as as they become more of just a pipe. Yep. And because I think o- over time, I think people's willingness to make phone calls on the regular cell phone kind of calling platform is uh, is dropping off. I think. And I think more and more calls are going to be going over the IP side, and they're trying to figure out and make sure that they have the, the the margins to make up for that loss in the cell phone side. But it is it is thoroughly disgusting what uh, what I'm having to pay. You know, it's it was just insane. And I you know so yeah. so what's it going to cost me to get to two megs? And to get to two megs is two ninety nine to get to two megs. So. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. I've been told to to call someone at Hawaiian Telecom and talk to them. They say they've got a, they might be able to help me, but uh, only time will tell on, time will tell yeah. on that. Huh? I wonder... You would think that the cost of that stuff would go down over time, but I think it's the exact opposite. <laughs> right, right. I th- I think you're right. Well, I got some stuff here, and um, I got a Microsoft uh, topic that. I want to see if you can weigh in on it or not. Microsoft, uh, you know, during a keynote at WPC, basically said that it will have a single ecosystem for PCs, tablets, phones, and TVs. And the people are asking, does this mean Windows is Windows dead? Are they going to come up with some no, some sort of new? I guess, new way of, but, you know, I, I, I don't understand how they could make Xbox and everything else a part of the same ecosystem as, as PCs, tablets, and phones. Yeah I, I, yeah, I think what's happening is it's an evolution of just bringing together as much of the technologies as they can um, into one consistent platform that um, apps can run on and, and um, in kind of a common UI experience and uh, for all screens, right? I mean, there's going to be slight differences in the UI and the functions uh, based on that, that that screen, right? I mean, what you do on a phone isn't the same thing as what you do on a big screen TV. So, um, but the 
the common core of the operating system and the common functioning um, is all consistent across all the rules screens. So that's really, I think, what I would take away from that is trying to bring consistency across the all of the screens. Um, so really, it's just as simple as that. Well, well Andy's joined us here. He he, uh, he bounced in. I guess Jeffrey must have slept in, Andy. It, it, well, that's what I thought. I uh, I figured, okay, we got Jeffrey well in hand, <laughs> so I went over to the... Uh, uh, to the, uh, um, to the, uh, uh, the, the hangout and, uh, uh, got d distracted by a hot dog and, uh, you know, here's lunch and time, time for lunch. So we, we flipped on the laptop in there and I'm, and I'm expecting to see, uh, uh the Robin Jeffries show and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the Robin Tom show. <laughs> Well, you you've got quite the background there. Uh, where you're not in the, the in the in the studios. No, no, I am I am actually here uh, on uh, on the back patio screen porch uh, arrangement, and you know I've got my uh, glass of uh, of uh, lemonade here. I got some coffee and uh, and I'm I'm practicing for a visit in Todd and Hawaii because it's like 82 degrees and about 90 percent humidity. Well, I'm, making, I, I'm making you a lower third here, Andy, so let me see if I got that right. <laughs> I, I think I spelled your name right. Yep, we're good. <laughs> uh, well, you got two A's there, or three A's. Oh, or... yeah, I do, so we'll fix that here in a second. But uh, it's uh, that's quite the nice background there. You know, it, uh, it kind of looks the same way out my window, but it's in front of me. Yeah, uh, it's pro <laughs> probably uh, too much too much sun out there, but there's uh, you know a backyard uh, garden and uh, and uh, nice uh, nice big trees and uh, it's actually quite pleasant out here in the evenings, but uh, not so much right now. So I hear you you're uh, you're grandpawing this weekend. I am I am indeed, and we've had uh, uh, quite. I, I needed to to, to rush home and. Uh, uh, get some of that uh, duty taken uh, taken care of, but uh, we're we're having fun. Uh, they're continuing to uh, uh, to enjoy some watermelon uh, in, inside here. <laughs> but I thought it'd be quieter outside. It was like I, one of us had to be inside, the other had to be outside. So I guess uh, they got the air conditioner. Well, I heard you're having some TriCaster woes. What's what's going on with your TriCaster? Well, I uh, I am am having some uh, some some serious problems uh, there. Uh, about a week ago, we started getting some really bizarre symptoms that, um, be, because the unit had been extremely reliable and uh, we had actually been using it to, to, uh, to stream content in addition to uh, 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 recording production and so forth. And um, uh, we got into a, uh, uh, into a live production situation where you would, uh, uh, either from keyboard or mouse, you would uh, click to take a camera and it might... Uh, uh, be a couple of seconds before it would um, before it would switch over, and it was really kind of the symptoms that maybe a stick of ram had gone bad, or, you know, where the machine uh, it was working with uh, far less memory than it was normally uh, used to. But uh, back at the DOS level, that uh, uh, seemed uh, not not to be a problem, and uh, finally I isolated uh, that down to a. Uh, uh, to a graphics card that had a uh, GPU fan that had uh, the bearings in it were uh, starting to seize up, and, and uh, so that was overheating. So that made a lot of sense. And I uh, put that in, uh, and that cured it for about a half a day. And uh, we had a situation where we uh, recorded uh, in the morning uh, without any difficulty, and then uh, uh, as luck would take it, of course, when you have uh, – you know, one person in California, one in Oregon, and uh, somebody who's just driven an hour to uh, be live in the studio. Um, <laughs> uh, that's the time that, <laughs> that things break down. And uh, so I got shipped back to the factory. They had indicated it would be as many as 10 working days, and I was was pretty concerned about that, but wasn't wasn't much we could do. And then, uh, lo and behold, uh, here we come f uh, five working days, and uh, the unit shows up. And uh, so we're thrilled uh, to uh, put it uh, back into service. And uh, uh, yeah, about an hour later, we were, we were less than thrilled because uh, we we couldn't get the, couldn't even get the power on post uh, the the power on self test to work. <sighs> and uh, 
they went in and reseated the cards and, you know, did all, all that kind of stuff. And I don't know whether it got damaged in shipment or, or what had occurred. It, uh, you know, was, was in, in a foam uh, uh, carry bag and then had uh, probably an inch and a half of plastic peanuts around that and then the external corrugated box. So it uh, uh, must have may, may gotten kicked off the back of a truck somewhere. So it's back on the... It's back on its, it's on its way back to, <clears throat> to New Tech. Antonio, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And of course, this always happens yeah. on the weekend. Right. <laughs> where where you get to have, you know, pay, paying extra for the uh uh for the uh, uh overnight shipping there. Oh jeez. So what did uh what we need to do is we need to find you a dealer. <clears throat> There's one in Illinois and see if we can get you a start getting you a loner i actually i would just uh just got an email from um the uh, uh fellow who has the uh, uh franchise for uh, uh for for indiana and uh and michigan yeah, he's down in bloomington uh he has a loner but he has that uh committed uh here uh august 4th so <laughs> it wouldn't it wouldn't be able to uh, to help us help us out there well that's that might give you 14 days you know, so is it worth it? Uh, well, I, uh, that's what I'm trying to to uh, trying to ask myself right now. <laughs> if you want to drive to Bloomington or not? Yeah, well, that's uh, that's uh, that's something we'll we'll wait and see. And uh, is he is he going to? Of course, he's probably going to charge you for that rental, right? Oh, I, I feel sure we haven't even gotten to that. Uh, <laughs> haven't even got to that uh, to that stage. And and the the folks at New Tech were quite apologetic, and um, you know they've put us on the expedited list. So I, I feel sure that that they'll be putting some attention to it here as soon as they get it there Monday morning. Um, uh, and and one of the things that 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 has kind of impressed me about their operation is that uh, um, you spend a lot of time on on the uh, phone on hold, but once uh, once they do answer up, uh, they are just you know, all about however long you need to talk. And, uh, and they're pretty good uh, on the repair policy too. Uh, they are good on the repair policy. And, uh, if you ship it in, uh, you know, uh, overnight, they ship it back the way you ship it in. And so that indicates they're pretty serious. So how much did your repair cost you? Uh, my repair has not cost me anything so far. That's right. That is a good they, thing. They are, there, if it unless it's something that's really went bad, usually your repair cost is zero. And how and that machine's probably mm -hmm. five years old now. I don't know, three years, four years. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. And yeah, and that's true. Yeah, they did replace uh, one of the input. Uh, uh, one of the inputs uh, uh, was bad on the connector card. They put a new front panel, a new USB uh, uh, connector block, and uh, uh, you know, and and some other other things. So. Oh yeah, um, that that was there was a connector block on that that was broke. That was nice. They replaced yep. that. Yep, they did. And so, uh, uh, so we'll just have to have to see. But I do have to say, trying to go with uh, some other alternatives and come up with a plan B, it's like, uh, uh, you know, once you get used to that level of performance, you just can't go back. Now, one thing I've been doing here, Andy, is I've been building up my portable studio trying to figure out to make that video flow better mm -hmm. and um i did order that black magic strip you know what i'm talking the about 64 yeah. oh the oh the uh the uh the uh, switcher right and it's well it's wow. it's i didn't buy the switcher i bought just the component piece which was a thousand dollars which allows you to control it with a pc and it's hdmi and sdin only Yes, yes. So that is what I'm uh, building up for my road show. So, and then I bought an H.264 video capture box that I'm going to be using on the road as well. And it takes multiple inputs, red, green, blue. I saw that H one. I was looking at that closely after you mentioned it last week. And uh, that's a very, very attractive unit. Yeah. And, it's, uh, and, t and if you tie that into this switcher that's coming, and it hasn't arrived yet, I've it was not, they said delivery a month from the time you ordered it. So we'll see how it all works in the flow. 
that uh, Rob, you just you just have to be getting some chuckles here because I remember um, probably four years ago you said to me, with video, it's not the money, it's the time. <laughs> That's true. Well, it's both actually. I think. Yeah. Say what? It's it's no, it's it's, it's yeah, definitely actually, it's definitely say. both. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys been paying attention to what Leo's doing over there at the uh, the brick twit house? And I don't know. You know, he's a. Well, we, obviously, that's a pun on words. But um, have you guys been watching what he's been doing in Petaluma? Yeah. Well, I think one thing that I, I, I should say about Leo is really early on, his whole mantra was to keep um, the cost down so he <laughs> could uh, make more money. And, and I really wonder if he's, uh, if he's forgotten his, his foundational mantra for what, what he's trying to do. I mean, he spent years complaining that, oh, yeah, they spent $10 million on studios and fancy equipment, and we don't need that anymore. But what exactly is what he's doing right now? Is he spending millions of dollars well, building a fancy well, studio? I was impressed on the solution they picked for their... Um, I'm getting a little video audio feedback. I was impressed with the solution they picked for their cameras. Yeah. Did you guys see how they're mocking up their cameras? Yeah. No, I haven't they seen pretty the behind the cameras too, yet. right? Uh, what were you saying, Rob? I say I haven't seen the behind the scenes on what, what what he's doing, but I did hear he's moving away from Skype, so he's actually trying to go all HD. But he's trying to because he's been mainly all kind of standard def up till this point. Right. And I'm getting feedback from some from one of you. Um, anyway, he's using Video V I D Y O is the name of the company for for his new video solution, and I don't know how that's going to work. Across, we'll have, it's going to be impressive, I'm sure. But uh, I think each person that's on a show has to have a right module or something. And then, what he's using for cameras is he's using, um, I believe, he's using Casio. Oh, I saw there was a huge stack of them, but it's about a thousand dollar camera. And he comes out of that camera, out HDMI out into a about a five hundred dollar um, HDMI to SDI converter, and then that's what he's feeding the TriCaster with. And he, I think he said those rigs are running him about two grand a piece. Well, that's a lot cheaper than a than a five thousand dollar SDI capable camera. And uh, I, you know, I applaud him for going that way. I just hope those cameras give him the 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 balance control for lighting and everything that he needs. Um, you know, he's got huge, those huge baby windows back there that are giving him a lot of light and light is sometimes can work against you. So yeah. we'll see how that ends up, uh, dialing in, but he bought, uh, I already bought six. Was it 60? No, I think 30. He's got 30 cameras. So a couple grand a piece, he's got 60 grand right in just cameras alone. Mm -hmm. And it's smart from set to set. He isn't going to have to move cameras. Yeah. They can, yeah, he but can just leave them wired still up. also yeah. has a, a kind of a pre-selector uh, uh, switching that he, that has to occur, right, in order to bring it into a, each of the 850s? Yeah, well, he's using a black magic. It's about a $15,000 board that, Andy, we can only see the top of your head. Yeah, so... It's, scroll your oh, web camera down. Yeah, well, the scroll is like uh, move the laptop. Oh, okay, I got gotcha. you. Hey, the so basically he has like forty. He he, he said it. it was just, it's a switcher, is all it is. And they, they only, down in their basement they have a tricast. I don't know how many tricasters he's running. One or two, but he's running one. And I know there's one tricaster in the basement that he's only doing four inputs on. <clears throat> he's not even using eight inputs. So they're going to switch it somewhere else. And then the TriCaster is just going to be the, the device that's going to feed. That's a pretty expensive. Uh, yeah. But he also might be using a TriCaster like I'm using it for doing re-videoing code. You know, I'm basically taking the SDI out of the TriCaster and I can feed it to multiple boxes. 
are there different flavors of SGI uh, or or is that interface uh, uh, pre pretty much uh, standard throughout? It's pretty standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it carries audio on the line too. So if you want audio on the line, you can you can do. I don't use it that way, but anyway, we've we've veered way off the geeky path here, and we're not talking any <laughs> tech. But it's gonna be, you know, I, I'm I'm excited for him. I I hope that uh, I hope they do well. You know, I've been working on this. Boy, oh boy, you know, I, I keep adding things to my Excel spreadsheet on you know, baseline cost for setup and, you know, just on my estimates of what it's going to cost me to get started, what I want to start here in Hawaii, um, it's a pretty big number, you know, from a dollar and cents standpoint. And that's not using any of this equipment. This is keeping this studio intact and building a whole new studio from scratch that would run different content and not tech, of course, but... um it's it's a big number, it's it's a big 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 number. And bandwidth costs here are double or triple. Yeah, I've been following uh, your your discussion there with uh, w w with a lot of interest because uh, I, I don't know whether um, you know, whether there's some some uh, rougher waters that I'm going to run into with the relationship with Comcast uh, here here locally. Uh, I also uh, noted, I didn't take uh, the time to read through the article in detail, but uh, it looked like Chris Perillo had some uh, uh, some real issues with bandwidth caps there. I think but perhaps you and, uh, and uh, um, Rob talked about that a little bit earlier before I signed on. Well, not so much bandwidth caps, but I'm running into major issues with the uh, upload speed cost. Yeah. You know, you know, I'm talking 800 bucks a month for just five megs up. Wow. Yeah. And uh, you know, that's that's if I sign for a year contract. Seven seventy five if I sign a two year contract. So you mean you save twenty five bucks a month? Oh you yeah, you, you actually you say fifty because it's actually eight twenty five. I see. Yeah. So you and, oh they that that doesn't include the cost to pull the fiber. So whatever that cost may be. Mm. So he's, he's the guy's I'm talking to the guy on the phone. He's like, well, why don't you call me before you run a place? I'll tell you if you've got fiber in there. So I told him the location we're looking at, and he was pretty shocked of, of the location. He says, boy, he says, that, that might be a hard one. He says, I don't think that building's got any fiber. <laughs> mm. And it's downtown Waikiki. And, uh, you know, so I'm sure it's going to be real cheap to pull fiber down in the uh, metropolitan Waki key and ha shut traffic off and pull fiber for Todd to a studio. So, yeah, that's going into my, you know, it could be 50 grand. Yeah. You definitely want to oh, get yeah. a building that has bandwidth. Yeah. Well, you know, if the, if the goal is aesthetics over bandwidth, <laughs> yeah. You know, the last thing I want to do is be in a warehouse. Uh, when the camera's on, I want to see Waki the beach in the background, not. Not this. <laughs> so anyway, hey, let's uh let's talk about Google for a second. Google is uh staffing up on patent lawyers and it may have a little bit to do with some rulings that have been coming down. An international judge determined that HTC has infringed on two of ten Apple patents. And this is in relationship to some stuff running on the Android device with HTC. So um, it doesn't, they don't feel that there's uh, enough synergy where HTC will be able to buy, and there's not a final ruling yet, but this is in December. This ruling will come out, but an interim ruling has said that they do infringe. And there's some very deep, I mean, I don't know how these can actually be patents, to be honest with you. It just seems like it goes to the layer of what a lot of people do with software these days. But anyway, this uh, with Apple having the upper hand on HTC, this could turn into an interesting uh, development here where Android starts getting taken out because of Apple patents. So Well, or, or there's just a lot of money exchanging hands. 
um, behind the scenes, which is more likely to, to be what happens. The, the thing, though, is, is they're saying here that Apple, they don't feel, at least in this article that I'm reading over on fosspatents.blogspot.com, is that HTC has, doesn't have too much to offer, and Apple may, you know, may not. And they're going to, you know, they'll go after a damages claim. Um, it says, theoretically, Apple could grant HTC a license, which is how Microsoft resolved the Android IP issues. More than a year ago, HTC signed an Android-related patent de license deal with Microsoft, but I doubt that Apple will offer HTC a license unless HTC owns and effective controls any patents with that Apple needs, in which case the two companies could cross-license. The uh, HTC is buying a company called S3 Graphics, which uh, Apple has some patent issues with so that they can have, you know, looks like some leverage here. But is this patent stuff getting out of control? And is it going to, you know, the, I guess the bigger discussion point here, are we going to start seeing companies not be able to innovate and move forward because of software patents? Well, I think that that's, well, that's the case. Go back to I mean, I think that that's, that's been the issue all along. But uh, if you look at really what happens in the marketplace, though, typically, uh, at least with the bigger companies, that, that doesn't necessarily stop them from charging ahead and doing it anyway. I mean, if you look at what, you know, I mean, Apple and all these guys have portfolios of patents, and it's almost like a detente, right? Um, you know, I've got this patent on this one, and you've got that patent on that one. Those kind of just wipe each other out, right? Or if one company has one uh, that the other one is trying to use, then the one that's trying to use it just pays the other company, you know, like a per-use per license for using that technology. So I think that there's always a, a path for resolution. I think it's un rather unusual that a patent will actually take down a company or totally put them out of business i think it's just uh it's just behind the scenes legal negotiations that go on and financial dealings but you know but behind the scenes and that's really what this is all about andy yeah i uh again i'm going back to the uh, uh to the, uh, the book that that uh, we had talked about here a few months ago um historically this is very much the uh, pattern that has occurred uh, first in uh, telephone uh, technology and uh, and uh, uh, later in uh, in radio technology, uh, where the uh, the major players uh, recognize that there's there's actually uh, more to be made in a cross licensing or pooling arrangement um, yep. that that that's actually to their benefit once you get through an initial shakeout period and and that. Uh, uh, shakeout period in the telephone industry was on the order of, uh, of 20 years, I think, radio, uh, a similar amount of time. Um, and, of course, with the acceleration that we have here, uh, many of these patents uh, actually would date from the uh, 80s and 90s. So it's, it's interesting. It's, it's just about the same time frame, even though we think our technology should uh, be considerably speeded up. The, I guess the legal system uh, isn't. <laughs> That's certainly true. Yeah. And someday we're gonna have to figure out a way to get your guys' camera so your top of your heads are closer to the top of the screen. I know, Andy, you're having trouble because you got the Mac on the lap. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Let, let me let me move well, over to a uh, di different location. God, I'm just slouching. That's all. It is, is that what you're doing, I mean, Rob? I mean, you know, see the I see the bottom of your guys' chin sometimes. You know. <laughs> And, and I know Andy what he was doing. He was he was lounging in a in a a, a, a chair, you know, and uh, that's too high. Now your head, now your head's cut off. So funny. Well, you know, I don't I don't know what we're gonna see. I just think this is you know it it's 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 fun when the big companies fight each other, but it's not fun when this happens with small companies. And yeah. um, HEC is pretty big. You don't have to worry about them, but. Uh, what happens when they start, you know, strong arming the uh, when they start strong arming the, the the smaller companies? 
So I th- I thought it was funny though those past week, you know, there was um a lot of discussion going on about uh you know uh, basically flaunting their social stats and we had Google talking about how Google Plus now has uh, about 10 million users and they saw about a billion items shared and received per day and the Google Plus 1 button was being pushed 2.3 billion times a day and then Twitter came out with its uh it should try to show its muscle and it said um uh, that they were delivering 350 billion tweets a day and that uh, they saw 600,000 signups in a single uh, single 24-hour period. And um, But, you know, stats mean nothing if you can't follow the conversation. And, you know, unless someone ats me on Twitter, I just don't, I don't get the message. It, it rolls off the screen so fast there's no, you know, there's, you know, I have to, have to be sitting here watching it live. Whereas last night I walked here in the studio about 1030 after we watched a movie and lo- loaded Google Plus And between my 14 different circles, I was able to catch up on about um, 12 hours worth of discussion that, uh, you know, some of it was superfluous. Some of it was really good and got more out of that in in really about 15 minutes to 20 minutes then I probably got out of Twitter the whole week. So yeah, I agree. I guess if, yeah, the, the only time that I really get any benefit out of Twitter is if I'm actually, um, at, you know, Rob Greenlee in, in the message and it's almost like a personal, uh, public email, right? Um, that's, that's the majority of what I get out of Twitter and it's, and then having a conversation, kind of a public private you know kind of exchange with someone um, is where I see most of my usage on a day-to-day basis being um, and yeah I mean I think most of the time posts in there just go out you know and most people don't even see them I mean I don't really follow my my stream at all because I mean who has time to sit there and watch the stream all day long you just can't Andy, do you uh, have you been using Google Plus much to watch the conversation? The the thing I have enjoyed about it is the fact that it's uh, uh, I guess you would say segregated by context. Uh, that uh, that that because the way you can set up your circles, uh, the the stream seems to make more sense because it's it's somewhat bounded. Uh, if you're looking at a, a Twitter stream, you're following you know several hundred people. Uh, there, there are folks from from all different contexts that are coming in to you, that uh, make it uh, just you know a different sort of a uh, different sort of experience, and and then the other thing uh, to Rob's point, uh, I think uh, trying to watch Twitter uh, would be very very uh, uh, hard, very very disruptive from a uh, from a focus uh, standpoint, and. Uh, uh, you know that that's just kind of the the uh, way that that I would uh, would tend to use uh, circles over over Twitter. I think too is that we see a um, a longer comment chain. That's what I'm seeing so far. And you know, on Google, really the only way I find I mean, on Twitter, the only way I find stuff in context is doing searches for mm-hmm. topics, and it, it's very effective as long as you're doing those searches every day. And it, the search doesn't roll off, so I have maybe half a dozen saved searches, and it's you know it's on stuff I look for comments on PowerPress, so I'm going to load that right now. And uh, someone wants it some sort of tag functionality, so you know we're going to Angela's going to put that on the list. And then so you know I do a search here on on Blueberry, and I can see what's going on with that. But you know I go back to context, and here I. I saw someone comment about um, the ratio of people using the women to men, the men to women breakdown in Google. And basically, Google basically said the um, right in a post. He did a very, he almost did a blog post. I was kind of like, how'd you get the graphics in there, dude? Or he linked to an article and then he just wrote up some stuff and put in the links. And I said, wow, this is really what looks like to be the first time I've been referenced to something that looks like a blog post. And you know, let me just bring this up on the screen. And if this wasn't Google Plus on the top, 
you look at this and you think, oh, that's just a regular blog post. And then all the comments below and it goes on and on and on. And uh, someone said that uh, this is uh, potentially a threat to blogging. I, of course, people have been saying that for a long time, but I, why, what was that? You got a nice big bird out there, don't you, Andy? Hmm? <laughs> you didn't even hear it. <laughs> um, so anyway, the, uh, I guess that just proves the point. You, could, you know, you can find threaded in long conversations, but um, I'm not going to be blogging on Google Plus. And I think One it's thing a bad that idea. I've seen on on Facebook that happens quite often is is that you know you have a post in there and then there's comments that happen below and it's fairly common for the comments to kind of go way way off. Yeah, go sideways. Topic. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, have you guys noticed on Google Plus if the the comments and the topics in the comment, you know, follow the thread of the post? So, more there, I mean, it's more like what you experience in a blog post, right? Where people, people have, you know, on blog posts, people have a tendency to stay more on topic in the comments than I think on Facebook. I'm not sure kind of why that is. Well, I, I, and what I see is more segmentation. I see where someone says, okay, so you see this article written up by Paul Allen, and they, and they grab it, and then they make it part of their post. They say, hey, did you see this over here? And then yeah. my challenge is, is, okay, where's the source? So I go back and try to find the source article versus seeing the repost. And uh, I know they're working on some of those features. But anyway, it, yeah, well, so far it looks like everything stayed on um stayed on topic but topic, i see yeah. but i do see where people are saying in like in their messages here um hey paul call me you know so it was kind of like why didn't you just send him an email instead of and maybe he doesn't have his email yeah yeah potentially anyway enough on that let me move to this next uh next topic and we're going to talk about um the uh spotify you guys said uh, any of you get invites to spotify i i did and uh signed up and and uh have been playing around with a little bit um i'm still not uh, not sure that i understand exactly exactly what this is and how it's different from some of the other services well one thing that i kind of thought from my initial playing with it is it, the interface looks a heck of a lot like uh like itunes doesn't it it sure does. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, this is interesting what they have done here um, from that perspective. But um, Lou's on, uh, Lou Trek is up on the uh, Tech Podcast stream. So we're, we're live today at techpodcast.com forward slash live as well. So he basically, um, and let me bring this up. I don't know if you've got a chance to see it yet or not, Rob. Let's see if I can bring it up and put it in the screen. If I can shrink it down enough. Yeah, I haven't played around with uh, Spotify, but I hear that it's not a whole lot different than, you know, a bunch of other music services. Well, nothing to go against the Zune, but what my kids were pretty pumped about was they... I've been bugging me for, they want a different device. They want uh, a small, you know, small Apple device. And uh, my daughter's, you know, 15 now. So, you know, it's, it's all about styling and which, you know, what shoes you're wearing. And it's not cool to have an older Zoom. So it's, uh, it's you know, brown, that you remember the Gen 1 brown Zoom? I do. Okay. That's what she's been using. So, you know, oh, okay. it's uh, it's not real it's stylish. Probably it's probably <laughs> time to upgrade. Yeah, and uh, but I see on here where they have the ability to essentially to, you know, you basically can take the music with you too, and um, uh, from she was all excited. Oh, oh, oh! So that means I, you know, I, I'm, I'm like, calm down and catch your breath. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't look a lot different than a lot of other services out there. But she was excited that she could take the – and we haven't played with it yet. 
but she's excited she could take the uh, the music with her. Now I have a little. Let me bring this back here. I had a I bought a i an iPad or an iTouch um, a couple of years ago that I was going to give away during a promotion, and um, it's set up on my shelf for two years in a box, and so I opened it up. Uh, last week and got it charged and synced and updated and um, we've got a little bit of a deal going on right now. She's got a few things she has to do before she becomes the pride owner of a. I guess this is this is not a big one. It's only a it's an eight gig uh, iPod Touch. So she's uh, on her best behavior at this point, as you can imagine. Uh, Dad's holding the, the the keys to having an updated uh, media player, but um, I'll probably. Plug this in and see how it works with uh, with spot with uh, Spotify, and see how taking the music with you really works. But it doesn't have no problem reaching to the iTunes database, does it, Andy? No, it doesn't seem to have problems um, there. And you know, there's some um, you know, some obscure stuff, but that's uh, uh, that that I haven't been able to find. But uh, part of that's probably uh, age related as much as anything. Just in a, oh, by the way, Andy, you still have a server over at GoDaddy? I do indeed. Well, new there. I want you to write up a trouble ticket and say, it is my understanding that I can ask to have my network speed on my server increase to 100 megabits per second for oh. free. Please do that. I uh, will absolutely do that. Because I had this conversation, I was, you know, I'm going through a server upgrade right now. My box that I've been on is uh, is running a relatively old operating system. It has been um, serving me well for the past seven years, but it's time to go to new hardware. And uh, so I had ordered a, a new Ubuntu box. And, uh, you know, I got this, you know, account executive on the phone who is basically my handler whenever I have, I'm pissed off that they've done something to mm -hmm. a customer or something like that. I can call him mm -hmm. up and he goes, talks to Bob or Warren. And uh, I said, by the way, I said, how come I can't see what speeds the servers are? I said, you guys don't put on there whether they're 10 or 100. And uh, he says, oh, they're all 10, but you can ask to have it upgraded to 100. I was like, uh, huh? Uh huh? Huh? That's a big difference. You, you can ask. You know, and he's, yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. So about uh, two minutes after I hung up with the phone on him, I submitted eight trouble tickets for our for eight the eight servers we have. I said, please upgrade them to 100 within 45 minutes. Each one of them had been responded. And go over to geeknewcentral.com today. It's like the server has a new lease on life. <laughs> and... I'll be honest with you, I'm pissed. Um, I'm going to have a have a long email to the hierarchy, and this one will go right to the right to the very very top, and say, "Listen, that's not cool." And uh, I'm sure well, the reason they do it is if everyone asks for a hundred, it would cost them more on infrastructure. Yeah, but but at the same time, you know, if you're paying for uh, you know, for a dedicated box and uh, an on-call support, I mean that's uh, that's a considerable. I mean that's that's my second largest, uh, you know, I, item uh, on on my uh, uh, connectivity list there. Right. Um, or you know, just my in my overhead is uh, is that GoDaddy uh, box. Yeah, and I upgraded well, to. That... A... Go ahead, Rob. Oh, I said. That shouldn't cost them any more money because you're paying on a per bandwidth or per usage basis. Right, right, right. So, really, all they're doing is is really kind of moving you up the 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 width of the pipe, right? So, what your capacity is. Yep. I would think it'd be in the, the, their advantage to but, put you on the hundred meg. But it also affects concurrent connections. So, you know, yeah, my traffic's right. been, you know, is is way up. And yeah. I'd outgrown the server, and uh, and and we needed a bigger box. So I went from uh, basically a, a Celeron 2.0 uh, box with a couple of uh, gigs of RAM, and I am now going to be on a 
about a three times as powerful box, multiple cores, lots of RAM, um, more bandwidth, uh, you know, just because, you know, I'm moving. Well, I, but you know, my websites at this point is moving about, um, just in web traffic alone, I think we're up to about uh, five terabytes. And um, so I have to, you know, it's, it's, and the 10 megs wasn't doing it. Um, you know, and we're having people complain about slow page loads. And I think I was getting docked on speed by Google. So yeah, we're going to go to this next box and we'll see, or not five terabytes 5,000 gigs I guess that's about right isn't it is that five yeah that's five terabytes mm -hmm. yeah it is so anyway um boy you know as soon as they switched I did a page reload I was like huh that's interesting but I still need to go to new, new a new operating system so you know that's I'm not blaming them for that for a box have been on seven years but at the same time it had been nice to been on 100 megs for all this time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think particularly if you got a lot of video on your on your uh, on your on your front page. Right. And you know, none of that's being served from that site, but it's still that just that load time because mm -hmm. it's going out in queue and other things too. So we'll see now how this all plays out. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I hate moving servers. It sucks. It really does. Yeah. Hey, Todd, is uh, your uh, streaming here, is, is that uh, through the uh, network that you uh, uh, investigated here a month or two ago? Uh, which? As, as opposed to Ustream? Yeah, on live.geeknewcentral.com and on the front page of Geek News Central is Amazon Stream, yeah. Yeah. How does it look? Uh, now, now that you've had that up for a couple, three months, uh, you, you're still uh, uh, happy with that arrangement? Absolutely. Yep. Would not... Uh, you know, Ustream is secondary, and anything I do at this point, Ustream or any other service is secondary. And I'm not even on Justin, and I'm not using Justin anymore because they only retain the videos for like 10 days. So it's, you know, it's not even worth being on over there because they'd have no, they have no retention, uh, long-term retention. So, so far I'm happy with, uh, with Amazon. Now, it's a little quirky. And I've been trying to get them to, because what happens is if I stop the stream right now that's uh, up, if I shut that off, there is no restarting it without restarting the stack. So it's a 20-minute it's a process to bring the stack down and bring the stack back up. So it's not a fast recovery. You know, so I basically, it takes 10 minutes to launch the stack. And then once it's up, it's up, it's running good. And as long as the stream is into it, it's good. But if you have a hiccup, you're not just turning the stream off, waiting 15 seconds and turning the stream back on. Yeah. So, so when you say the stack, you're talking about the EC2 instance, which yeah. leads to the cloud front instance, which leads right. to, you know, et cetera. Actually, you actually launch the, the, uh, the, Ust the uh, Amazon stack actually gets launched on, um, let's see, let me bring this up here. You actually launch the the service. I'm bringing up the control panel. Um, you launch it in CloudFormation, and from mm -hmm. CloudFormation, they create a a cloud front connection, and then they launch the EC2 instance. And let me actually tell you how it actually boots. Um, all right, let me click this. And it is interesting how it goes through and, and builds its. Um, Starts out by building a cloud formation stack. It then assigns the EC2 security group. It deploys the Route 53 DNS data because I'm, I'm on a dynamic IP. I'm not on a static. Then it does a cloud front distribution. It builds the EC2 instance and then updates the Route 53 record set and then it confirms the stack. And then it's up and running. Um, I started the stack this morning at 5.08 5 a.m. And it took to 5.18 a.m. for all that to be accomplished. And, to, and then you fire up your uh, your Flash Media encoder and point it to that then, huh? And then all I do is hit stream on the TriCaster and it's connected. So I have the location. And what I did is I set up a domain, um, which if you look at the source code of my webpage, you'll be able to see what it is. 
but it doesn't go to anything. That domain's kind of a dummy domain. And in order to make it easy and not have for, a lot of this, it's a better way to do it, but I'm not an EC2 guy. So I just used a, a throwaway domain to actually run the stream box. The box that the stream is running is coming from um, a dummy domain. But, you know, really that's eerie. It's superfluous because people are just looking at the stream anyway. They don't care where the media is coming from. And and how long, what's the longest you've left this nailed up? Well, I, I've left it up uh, 24 hours, I guess. And, um, and it's been pretty, it's been, you know, it hasn't, the cost hasn't been too bad. You know, you are incurring a, a per hour cost on the EC2 instance, and you're, I'm running a, a large instance. So that is, you know, if you let that run for a whole month, um, that'd be about $400 to let that instance run for a whole month. So, wow. so it's not a, an inexpensive instance to run. But also, um, let me just bring up and look at this, the stats right now. Um, it's that you have to infer how many people you've had on the stream. So right now we're pushing um, in bytes out. We're pushing two hundred and fifty, about two hundred and fifty thousand bytes out right now is what we're pushing out. That's so that tells me there's a significant number of people on the live stream. And if I do the math. Wow, that's actually pretty high. We're normally not that high, 250,000 divided by. Yeah, we probably got about 500 people on the stream right now. So the uh, and you're paying for that out that outgo bandwidth. So, you know, you're paying for those bytes at a, at a per gig price. You're paying uh, 15 cents a gig on that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and plus the time. So, um, and I can actually look and see the performance of the network speed into the box too. Um, the stream that I'm pushing in there today is about a 500 kilobit stream. So it's not very high. So if you started with a, uh, with a smaller instance rather than large, you can't get, uh, auto scale. You can't, you have to start with an M1 large. Ah, Okay. Uh, no, if you want to, you can sc auto scale it by bringing the stack down and selecting a larger instance. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do during, if we do the podcast awards this year, what I'm going to do is I will bring in the, um, I'll, I'll launch the biggest instance they have and, uh, and run that for an hour. It'll be, a, it'll be a hundred dollar hour because I'm going to be running like the equivalent of like 10 machines. Uh, because it'll be their biggest instance. It'll be it'll be a monster instance, and mm -hmm. uh, but it'll be an expensive hour. But I won't be inundated with ads from UStream. Right, right, and and then so so what would the peak viewership uh, be on uh, on that? Could that hand, handle thousands of viewers? Yeah, it could handle thousands. thousands. We're handling five hundred and fifty right now on an M one large. Here. Because mm -hmm. see, what's really happening is is they're using CloudFront. You're you're paying for the instance, but the media is actually being served via the cloud front, and and that is kind of how they're, you know, how this thing is scaling. And it's a, uh, you know, I haven't been able to peak test this thing, um, and, mm -hmm. and see where the mm -hmm. where the crash point is. Um, no one's complained about the stream. Now I had a an internet failure here the other night when I was online. And the actual internet went out. And, of course, you know, there's nothing you can do there. You're done from a local standpoint. But, um, yeah, they give you a basically a stream URL. And it's the same every time as long as you have. I've got a little cheat sheet here. And I won't show you the front of the page because it's got my key and everything on there. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, this little cheat thing, there's four, thing, four, four items on here. And it's I have to put those in. And it's that does it. That sets it up. But my bill's been a hundred bucks a month mm -hmm. for this. I'm getting a lot of audio feedback. I don't know where that's coming from. 
So what do you guys think about the Netflix price increase? Well, I, I saw a summary that I thought was pretty neat. It, it said, on a percentage basis, you should be really upset. <laughs> but this is like really the equivalent of, uh, of, of a uh, large burger and fries. So why are you upset? Rob, are you a Netflix user? No, actually, I'm not. But, um, yeah, I just got really got the impression it was more about trying to shift people off of um, – um, shipping DVDs to people, so they're trying to save costs on postage and that kind of stuff. It's that's really, I think, in the bigger picture, you know, as an overall company, I think they want to move towards uh, doing everything digitally. Well, the problem though is, is that the amount of st content that's available on the stream is just a small portion of stuff that's available via DVD. And if I could get everything that's on their system on live yeah. stream, I'd be cool. I could do that. But I look at, uh, well, you know, we cut the cord here, so I'm very dependent upon Netflix. I'm dependent upon uh, my Roku and in my boxy. And, you know, that's where we're getting a lot of our content or all of it. And, and believe it or not, we're even using the Amazon TV as well. But, uh, you know, here's the, here's my thought on it. Um, we rent or I get two DVDs a week, at least two. If it depends how fast the kids will in the summer here, the kids have been cycling them through quicker, but Friday night's movie night. So we watch movies on Friday night and usually watch two movies. And then Saturday morning, the discs are back in the mail. And by Tuesday, I've got new DVDs waiting for Friday. We could probably cycle again. But sometimes my wife will supplement by stopping at the red box and picking up a couple of DVDs, DVDs down there. And, you know, so we're, you know, we're pretty DVD heavy. So I'm, I, you know, I basically I went and looked at our bill to figure out how much we were spending on red box. And I'm on average spending about $6 a month on red box. So, you know, not a lot of DVDs. And then, um, we're probably watching 20 to 25 different streams on, on, uh, on you stream. I mean, on, on Netflix and then we're getting eight DVDs. So, you know, that's like 30, 36 movies and I'm paying, you know, a grand total of $26 for a buck a piece. Um, I took my kids to transformers and we went to the three D <laughs> we went to the three, we went to the three D part. All right. Yeah, I saw it too. Okay. Yeah. Did, you, did you go to the 3D part? I did. How much was your ticket? Uh, it was fourteen dollars. Fourteen ninety eight and no passes. So I I couldn't use like my retired ID card to get a discount. I couldn't get a matinee cost. It was fourteen ninety eight. And you know, I haven't been to the movie theater in really probably three to five years. Maybe it hasn't been that long, but it's been a while. And when my wife's with me, she always carries her big purse, right? So she's got all the snacks in the purse. You know, dad don't do that, right? So I'm $45 getting in the door with, you know, three kids and me. I did get $10 on the youngest one, I think, for the price ticket. And then I went to, you know, I didn't even pay attention to the price of the snacks. I said, you know, two popcorns and two Cokes. <laughs> big mistake. later. <laughs> Thirty six dollars. Just oh wow. Two popcorns okay. and that was a special. That was a special deal. You got a popcorn and a coke. And I so the guy said, Do you, that I didn't order nachos or anything. You didn't get that other guy's stuff on mine. He said, No, no, no. This is this is the cost, seventeen something each. I said, You're smoking crack. <laughs> you know, it was and it was already there and swipe goes the credit card. I, I so yeah. seventy five, eighty dollars to take the kids to the movies, and I understand why my wife sneaks in the bag of snacks and stuff in her big purse. Um, Smuggle, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm taking the cleaners on that one. Yeah. So anyway, I'm not going to complain about my twenty six dollars I spend on videos a month. Yeah, but you can. But Todd, 
let, let's be honest. I mean, you can go to the movie theater for pretty inexpensive. True. Just don't buy all that other true. Stuff. <laughs> true. If you, if you don't go to the 3D yeah. and you go to the matinee on a regular movie, yeah. I think we can get five dollar tickets. So long as you, or, yeah, as long as you don't uh, buy the candy or the or the popcorn. Yeah, uh, we do have a movie theater here that's a three dollar ticket. So wow. Wow. The films are about probably about a month behind, but uh, yeah, that's not too bad. I think we've got one of those too, but it's in a theater that I wouldn't want to even put my feet in the floor on. <laughs> it's not yeah. a it's, it's it's a true movie theater. It's a place where people go, but it's so cheap that they I don't think they have uh yeah I don't think they have enough money to pay for someone to actually mop the floor at the end of the night. You know, <sighs> so it's pretty grimy. Yeah, so so you have a popcorn stand that serves uh, that that shows movies on the side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, let's talk about Google's death grip, and this has got me a little bit concerned. You know, back in February, uh, Google started changing the way it uh, does its search engine ranking, and I know some people here in Hawaii that have legitimate sites that have gotten hammered. Their business have been destroyed, primarily a, a specific travel site. A buddy of mine that's on a travel site. And, um, but anyway, you know, some of those sites just needed to be knocked down. You looked at what Mahalo was doing and a, a few other sites and it was, um, it was a, you know, a, for me, it was a huge traffic boost where we've seen 25, 35% increase in traffic be because of those bad sites being driven down those content farms. But the folks over at hub pages, has determined that if they move everything into, um, what do they call it? It's it's a sub uh, dun, 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 a subdomain. So if they put each of their authors on a subdomain, so it would be john dot dot com, that Google is going to index them differently, and they're already seeing as much as a, a seventy five to a hundred percent increase or seventy five percent to a hundred percent recovery of traffic to those pages on by putting each of those um content topics into a subdomain so i'm thinking god here we go again here comes this crap um and i'm sure google will probably have to deal with that at some point but um, i guess for smaller sites if you're having issues with traffic uh subdomains may be a good way to go hmm and uh, it might get uh, people's traffic back. I'm looking for my my back scratcher because I'm going to pull the window shut. I have, I have to reach across to pull the window shut or I have to unplug here and walk <laughs> around. And, yeah, we can see the sun uh, coming in on the mic there. Uh, yeah, it keeps flashing me in the face once in a while. So uh, the sun is up in Honolulu. But um, what do you think about these uh, computers that are tablets slash PCs? In other words, uh, you can... Um, Office has one where you can use it as a regular laptop and then you can pull the top off and it becomes a tablet. And there's a few of these that have launched on in the marketplace and I know that uh, there's gaming tablets that they're considering launching and so forth. Do you think this is going to, any of these are going to make any headway or is this going to end up being a niche product? Yeah, I've seen some of them that were really, really thin that actually the... Um the flat kind of tablet surface actually kind of slides up um, and exposes a keyboard. I think for some, uh, you know, laptop replacement type scenarios, I, I think there's a place for that. And, and I think as the, as these, these devices get thinner and thinner and the capabilities of putting a keyboard in there, I think a lot of people would love to have a keyboard as part of their um, slate or tablets. Um, but I also think that you're right. It's going to be a kind of a niche, a niche um, where a lot of people are just going to want to have just just the touch screen experience and not have a keyboard because they're doing mostly consumption. I, yeah, so I think it's a it, it's it's the really the the big issue between um, a what's called kind of a a PC slate versus just a regular slate, and I think. Right now, if you think about what's happening with like Windows 8 and like the the uh, 
the iPad, I think there's this misunderstanding, I think, around what what's happening with Windows 8 as as opposed to what's happening with the I, iPad. I think people think that um, the the slate needs to be like a, a you know, like a phone OS, um, and for Windows to put Windows 8 into a slate doesn't make sense. Um, I tend to disagree because I think it, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what the user um, thinks is is the operating system. It's more how the slate functions and how it meets their their needs is what's really most important. This this perception that's out there right now that the slate needs to be a phone OS or a very, very simple um, kind of kind of user experience, you know, not unlike what a phone is today, I think is kind of um, missing the, the bigger point. I think if you, if you look into the future, it's not going to matter um, really one way or the other. It's going to be, well, what does that slate device what is it capable of doing, and how does it fit my needs? Is what's more, most important. Um, so this, this, well, it needs to be this or it needs to be that. It, it isn't really the big issue. It's more like, okay, let's make a, a slate, that will actually satisfy all the needs, all of the computing needs that I have from a consumption, and a content creation or a work, type of, kind of platform. So anyway, that's kind of my concept of what I'm trying to say here is that Windows is going to become kind of that that versatile solution that will will really accomplish both things for people. It'll be a consumption device and a productivity device with the best of both worlds. Um, I, and I think that's what people in the long run are, are going to want. And let's not get caught up in this whole concept of, well, it's just Windows with a, you know, a layer on top of it. That's really not what's going on here. There's a fundamental change that's happening with Windows about how it's being architected to fit more in this kind of mobile kind of world. So, so that's kind of you know I get a little frustrated you know, you know when I hear bloggers and kind of technology pundits talking about how well all they're doing is stuffing Windows, you know, into a slate, and it's not the same thing as an iPad. Well, I tend to disagree with that. I think I get worried that Windows is going to change Windows. I think that would be disastrous. Change um, Windows from, from what perspective are you thinking? From a from a GUI perspective, you know, I you know there there's some fundamental things. It's just it's quick, and if they go in in you know I like what they did with the Windows Phone, but if they bring me a new menu system, a new GUI that is like Windows Phone on my desktop, um, yeah. that's going to be that's going to be a hard pill to swallow. Um, and, and I know they're messing with the GUI, so then there's yeah. there's a there's going to be a trade off there. I'm sure. I also understand where on a tablet I may want. I don't want a start bar on a tablet. I want everything real close, you know, where I can get to it quick. But on my desktop. I have everything very organized and laid out. I'm a very, you know, I got my folders on one side. I got programs here. You know, everything is in its place, and well, it's all. Well, I think that that's that's the real advantage of what what's coming with with the whole Windows 8 paradigm is that it gives you that flexibility to to do exactly that, Todd. And I think that that's it. It really depends on what the screen is and what the use. Scenarios, and you want to have an operating system that's flexible to be able to move into all those areas, and it's going to take some really advanced programming and really thoughtful UI um, to actually accomplish that. That's not an easy thing to accomplish because I think what most people think about is that okay, I mean, if you look at the 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 iPad today, it's designed just for the iPad. Right. I mean, it's very similar to the iPhone, but but it's not the same operating system that's running on, on your Mac, right? No. But if you could combine those into one operating system that would accomplish that for you, I think that's what people would want. That may, that may not be what, what our perception of what we want is today, just based on what the market is today, but I think ultimately that's what, that's what I'm going to want. I mean, I'm... 
yeah, I don't have a Slate device today because I'm waiting for that UI for a Slate that's running Windows um, that will give me both worlds, right? You know, that I can do all the same things that I'm doing today plus have a better, you know, experience on a Slate. So it it sounds like you want the operating system to get out of the way so that you have a common base that you can uh, can can learn and then build from that will then yep. adapt to the particular need or application that uh, that you're looking for so that if you need a a lightweight uh, reader uh, for the purpose of consumption of uh, of uh, published printed material ebooks and so forth it would be really nice not to have to think at all it, where it's in a totally familiar environment uh, to you, but at the same time, when you transition back to uh, uh, to a business task, uh, that uh, that once again that um, uh, basic UI is uh, something that uh, you're comfortable with and can be uh, and can adapt to can, and can be adapted to that task. Well, I think also that's where. Apple's, you know, with their iCloud, you know, I, I understand why they're doing it because they have a divergence between their desktop and their devices. And, you know, good luck getting your, you know, a document that you're working on in your Mac e- easily now into the, to the iPad. Um, it just, you know, it's, unless you're in iTunes, you do this, whatever you do to get this linked in and, you know, there's all these minutiae you have to go through, but at the same time, if you're, you know, windows has got the same issue. You just get, you just get air share and mount it up as a drive Uh, and just drag it over. Yeah. If you're, if if you're within physical range of that Uh, air share. Yeah. And, but you know what I have been finding using the Chrome, uh, OS is that, um, they're the closest, and people don't want to embrace it, but they are the closest right now of uh, all the all three groups because, you know, yesterday I went to, uh, my son had a, um, he's been going to a summer fun. It's not a camp. It's like a day camp type thing, but it's done by the the state recreation departments here. You have to pay for it. You sign up for it. And so he's been going to that. My daughter's like, um, one of the junior leaders, and so they had a big uh, dance routine. It was an entertainment thing they do at the end of the year, and uh, so I got my lawn chair out there. But they told us come early because you're gonna, you know, there's you know going to be like 500 parents there if you want a good seat. So you know I didn't have a lot going on, so I went. Uh, I got there an hour early and got up the front row and sat down and and they had the Chrome uh, book with me and I opened it up and I started working, and I was able to get an hour's worth of work done right there um just sitting kind of in this pavilion and people were asking me and actually I had a couple of business guys come up and ask me ask me what I was using and I told them the Chrome OS so I spent some time explaining what it was about but what I found was I had a proposal due I had a um some stuff to get into our campaign system I had um some stuff to edit on my blog and I was able to do all three of those items and access the data from the cloud. And it would have been the same way I would have done if I was using uh, Firefox and Windows or on my MacBook. But I had the connectivity right there with the, the device. Now, I could have done that with the iPad. I could have got my uh, uh, Windows machine out and connected the Internet and done the same thing. So there's some cross-convergence. But at the same point... Um, I couldn't have done it with my mobile device. I couldn't have done that work to the level I needed to with the tablet. I needed a, a keyboard, and I needed, uh, you know, be a place to put could you files. Have done it with your with the Could you have done it with a with a three uh, G uh, uh, iPad and and the Bluetooth keyboard? I, I remember at CES we saw some things. It was like an old aluminum clipboard that that yeah. The the i the iPad came out and then there was a Bluetooth keyboard. Would that have done it? I, I don't think so because I wouldn't have had access to. I needed access to physical files. Uh, uh-huh. You know, I needed a place, and I figured out now how on the Chrome to actually save a file that's in an email into a 
little storage bin they have. They don't give you a lot of storage. There's, but there's, and basically it, it gets killed if you haven't used it in like 10 days. But I was able to take that data and move it into um, a different, well, out of email and into um, our campaign system so we could put the deliverables there so people could start a campaign on Monday. I was able to make that transition. I wouldn't have been able to do that with the iPad, at least not in the way I know how the iPad works currently. But Rob, I think you're right. If you have accessibility to the same tools across different devices, even if it's a little different to get there, yeah, that's pretty powerful stuff. Rob, what's the timeline on uh, Windows 8? I don't think that's been officially announced yet. I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, it's it's. Uh, it's not be, that we would bait you here on the morning tech show, but uh, well, it's going to be, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that a definite date has been put out there yet. Um, you know, the late 2012 time frame is probably probably the most r realistic time frame for this. Um, but, you know, I'm not really pervy to even a lot of that Windows stuff anyway because I'm not on that side of the company. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just a matter, you know, I mean, a lot of the area that I'm working in is kind of kind of in a more on the media side and more of a supportive kind of role to that side of the business. So, um, yeah, I would say that, you know, you're going to see um, some more stuff around Windows coming out here, um, uh, probably a CES. You're going to see stuff start to come out more and more over the next year. And then um, and, and I think it'll be here before before we know it. Speaking of CES, Rob, we're uh, we're on the sponsor hunt. So uh, you are. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> so uh, you know, you guys are looking for some exclusive content. Uh, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta talk to us. <laughs> there you go. Well, I think I'm gonna definitely be going down to CES this year again. Hopefully. Yeah, we're we're trying to make a decision. Um, it looks like CEA wants us back, and. Um, from a live perspective, but we, you know, I really need a better booth location this year. So yeah. um, we'll see what they are willing to pony up. And I'd like to see if it's, uh, you know, if I can get a better booth location, then that will help the decision point. And uh, this year we're making each of the team members bring their own support staff. Um, so that, uh, you know, every person at least has one body that they bring um, that will help with carrying cameras or directing or whatever it may be. So uh, we we got some decision points to make here in the next couple of months. We don't know if we're going to go back to just doing the floor floor show or or what. We had great we had some great numbers um, for the live and the combined stuff. But uh, I got Mindy hot working on sponsor stuff now, so. I'm hoping that uh, we get a bigger sponsor base. That would really help the whole system. So anyway, let me go ahead and move on here. We're, we're actually where are we at in time? Oh man, we're we've got about seven minutes left, and I got just a few more. Oh, let's see what if I can. What's worth? Oh, there's a s study done by or a, a, a. It was actually a who did this. Um, chart. Well, Spark Capital, I think, did a a study on how much a, a user is worth, and this is over on techno techno technologyreview dot com. And let me see if I can bring this up. And I know you guys can't fully see this here, but starting at the bottom left, Ren Ren, second column, second graph is LinkedIn. Third is Pandora, fourth is Groupon, fifth is Google, sixth is Facebook, seventh is Twitter, and eighth is Zynga. And this is the revenue per active user. So it shows the actual revenue in dollars that these companies are making on a per user basis. And I found it was astounding that Groupon had as much as $80 of revenue per active user Um I haven't been able to get a Groupon deal yet, but
but it tells me that people are using one heck of a lot of the Groupon services. Now, Facebook, I think we all could agree, probably makes a good amount of money on us. They're making about 30 bucks. Facebook and all the rest of these guys barely get into the $5 range uh, per user. So does it surprise you guys that Groupon is making as much as $80 per active user? Yeah, on an annual basis? On an annual basis. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, yeah, I think about my own wife, and, and she's an active user of Groupon, and she she transacts quite a quite a bit there and and because usually when you buy something you feel like you're getting a 50 percent off deal right so people spend money there um thinking that they're getting a great deal which in actuality maybe they are maybe they aren't um but nonetheless there, there's a perception that it's like a 50 percent discount right it's almost like going yeah going and using a coupon. You also got a high unit sale. Yeah, I think if I think about what 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 my wife transacts, she probably each group on transaction that she does, she probably spends at least thirty dollars. Now we've got a local thing here, maybe because we're in Hawaii, we're kind of you know, we're we don't get as many Groupon deals, but there's a local thing that my wife has used several times where it's a two for one or something like that yeah. type of coupon. Now, here's the the other part of this article. It actually talks, okay, so that was revenue per u active user. Now let's look at the actual company valuation. So here you've got, um, this is the valuation. And so you see Groupon down here pretty low and Facebook and, and Google pretty high as you would expect. So yet, even though Groupon is making more per active user, the value in billions of dollars is is much lower on Groupon. Now, um, it is an interesting piece here, and I and I did Groupon hasn't IPO'd yet, right? They're getting ready to IPO. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. So maybe, and maybe this was a puff piece for Groupon to help boost their. Uh, um, and this is actually technology review, and it was out of India, so it was the India version of this. Um, so maybe Groupon is just trying to, uh, you know, make people understand the value of their company because they, they were under some heat, uh, recently for not having, uh, you know, real strong, real strong loyal base. And I, I think this kind of goes against this, but anyway, um, but of course, again, what do you define as an active user? Um, it's kind of like defining an active listener and, uh, it's pretty hard to define that as well. Yeah. Now, Citrix has bought Cloud.com for more than $200 million. So uh, Citrix is definitely spending some money to compete, and we got a demo on some new Citrix GoToMeeting features, Andy, that if you haven't seen them already, wow. it's uh, they, They're they back in the game with some new features that they're going to roll out, I believe, at the end of the month. and uh, None too soon. It's uh, it's pretty cool. Have you seen the new version of GoToMeeting? No, 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 I haven't, but I, I've certainly been conscious that it's getting kind of old in the tooth. Yeah, they um, the the maybe the the demo stuff hasn't changed so much, but uh, the added features, um, uh, it's going to make it a pretty compelling offering. Um, mm -hmm. and I can see us immediately starting to to use it, maybe even on this show. Um, that's how compelling it was to me. So uh, we'll, uh, and it's, I think you can actually get the beta. You just go over to their website and there's a beta link on the website and I think you can download the beta. So it's not a big secret, but I'm not supposed to start officially talking about it until August. <laughs> um, so TechCrunch redesigned their website. Uh, any of you guys see their, this is like their fourth or fifth version. Anybody, any comments on their new version? I, I do know some some elements though here. I'm going to show you guys something kind of funny, and we'll make this the last uh, article of the day. Um, okay, I want you to, to look at Geek News Central. See in Geek News Central, you see this line here, this nice uh, pixelated line on the actual menu. Now let's go over to TechCrunch and let's look at their menu. So they got some pixelation stuff here. Hmm, interesting, interesting there. How uh, um, minds think think alike 
Yeah. Uh, so you know some 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 design elements there that are about the same. So uh, interesting. Uh, anyway, I I still think my design looks cooler than theirs does. But there's you know there's this three quarters advertising. <laughs> <laughs> they ripped you off. Uh, funny. Well, you guys got anything going on? Any cool stuff? Andy, you got anything? How did your geocaching event go? The geocaching event was uh, was very interesting. As I mentioned, that's uh, really an entire uh, an entire subculture. And in fact, I need to um, uh, fire off a, an email to uh, to Angelo. For some reason, our artwork, which works uh, fine for geocaching world. Uh, on uh, iTunes and so forth. For some reason, the Tech Podcast version of that is uh, not getting picked up. So, oh, you uh, have I don't to know what... go at it. Just manage your account and load it. Yeah, yeah. I think that uh, 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 that I I've either missed that or I've got a PNG where I need to have a GIF or vice versa. Uh, PNG will work as long as it's square. Okay. Key is you have to have it square, six hundred by six hundred. Uh, Make that sure that may be. That may be the issue, but you, uh, you cannot... anyway, that's a very, very interesting uh, and very dynamic uh, community. So we, we look to hear a lot more from them. And there is another one that is uh, uh, we're going to be focusing on here uh, come first of August, which is uh, the same idea, but it is tied with uh, QR codes and uh, uh, and uh, and and a whole another level uh, associated with it. So we'll be talking about that as well. How did your uh, bandwidth go at that event? Did they have enough bandwidth? Oh no, no, that was a <laughs> a, a, a miserable, <laughs> a miserable time. Uh, both both with uh, uh, with with bandwidth and 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 just and just primary power. I think I think folks don't recognize the uh, amount of work that goes into uh, uh, planning and coverage of any streaming from live stream event. And when you see someone that's live streaming anything. Um, you, you, uh, if you've, if you've done that yourself, you know, how they are peddling, uh, uh, paddling under the surface to make that happen. So needless to say, the Wi-Fi that they were having at their event was very effective. Uh, no, uh, the Wi-Fi had some problems because, uh, <laughs> apparently they, uh, somebody stole one of their access points, uh, that, that they didn't have coverage in a certain area. And actually had some equipment stolen, so it was pretty frustrating uh, for everyone, I think. So, how did your coverage go of the whole event? Uh, we we ended up uh, uh, record recording it and uh, and then uh, assembling and uh, uh, and streaming it uh, once we got back uh, back to the shop. Well, that uh, did it. I, so, how's the re, re? Did you guys have life, fun? Life to hard drive. Life to hard drive. <laughs> is they say. So, Rob, how about you? What's going on with you? Oh, not a whole bunch. I'm I'm off to another Nissan Leaf event here after oh. we get off here. How so. did how'd your one last week go? You were the host or something or the MC or something, right? Oh, I just yeah, I'm the one that pulled it all together at the dealership and and um had had a bunch of other kind of leaf owners show up there to show off their cars and to you know, to talk with future potential leaf owners if they have questions and stuff and that's you know i'm gonna swing by with my leap today at a solar kind of like a it's like a, a solar event where the you know it's a it, it's basically a fair about solar technology so how many leaps have been delivered there in the seattle area i think the number that i've heard is probably around i don't know 250 300 something like that so are you going to be um, like the uh the nissan uh uh, official social guy or something at this point. He must be making some inroads there. No, I, I wouldn't say so. I just think that most of the leaf owners um, are fairly kind of out there as far as, you know, there's like parades and stuff like that that people want, wow. you know, electric cars to go down. And that, I mean, there's constantly every weekend, there's a bunch of events that need, need electric cars to to show up because it is kind of the current buzz right now um but i guess uh there's been about four thousand leafs uh, have been delivered to the u.s so far so it's um it's still really early days for it and Just... i'm not sure that a lot of people even realize you know you know as i'm driving down the street that 
that I'm I'm in an electric car. Well, just okay. need one that can go at least a hundred miles. Well, that's that's what this one does. It'll go a hundred. Yep. Hmm. Well, what was what's the sticker on those? I paid about thirty four thousand for. Thirty four. Now there's a seventy five hundred dollar federal tax credit on that, oh. and then I didn't have to pay any sales tax, so. In reality, it was about twenty five, twenty six thousand. Hmm. Well, it's actually not not bad. It's been a it's been a great car for me. I mean, I I'm really really happy with it. Interesting. How many miles do you have on that, uh, Rob? I've got a little bit over two thousand miles on it so far. Mm hmm. And can you plug into a regular outlet, or you have to have a special outlet? Uh, it's capable of being plugged into a hundred and ten volt outlet uh just a regular you know household outlet um but but i do have a special 240 volt um uh, charger downstairs right. in my garage right. that's specifically designed for charging electric cars well my wife's due for a vehicle i maybe have to consider it well i think on you know for probably most of the driving todd that you do there's probably i mean i mean so so on a daily basis, how many miles do you do you think that your household drives? Uh, about a hundred. Every day. Mm, pretty close. Really? It's at least uh about eighty, about eighty every day. It would be wow. eighty. That's with no, because you know you got to understand. Um, I'm in the I'm out in the country. <laughs> You know, I, I live. I'm in MS, I'm in suburbia, but I'm in the country, so depends on where we're going. Um, my wife, yeah, maybe a little less, maybe sixty. So, um, how so do would we, that be one one trip, or is that multiple trips during the day? No, that would be, well, yeah, probably where the vehicle would be parked, two or three different places. So. Okay. So you could actually uh, drive somewhere, come back, and plug in and charge. Mm, no, no, you you'd, you'd be gone all day. Yeah, if you're out. Yeah, especially with her. So we'll <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. We'll yeah. have to. It's interesting. It'll go a hundred. Will it really? Will yeah. it, thing is, will it go? Will it really go a hundred? Well, it depends. Hey, on you put the those uh, solar panels on the roof, uh, Todd. You'll be in great shape. <laughs> Right. Yeah, well, if it really goes 100 miles, not 90, if it really goes 100 miles, it's doable. But we have hills yeah, here, too, you know, so does it charge going down a hill or anything like that? It does. Yeah, yeah, it actually does charge going, going down hills, but it does use power going up, up the, the hill. hill. Right. <laughs> you know, as long as it charges going down the hill, then, you know. Got that Georgia I, Overdrive going. Yeah. Well, anyway, yeah, I think if... Yeah, if you are driving, you know, 90 miles a day, it, the car may not be perfect for you. It'd be tight. I mean, I think, yeah, and you don't really want to be out there driving. Well, I'm just going to I'm gonna start logging. We're going to start logging daily mileage and see what it really is. That's the only way you can really tell. Well, you have, what, more than one car, True, right? true. So I would have a gas vehicle if I needed to, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, that's, that's the perfect situation is to have a gas power car and an electric car and then you just kind of use the gas power car if you have longer trips yeah we basically have went to a i'm uh because gas got so crazy there we were carpooling anytime we could and it brought my gas bill down 200 bucks a month oh wow yeah my my gas bill before was between four and five hundred dollars was my gasoline bill a month so I'll come in handy when you have to go to the Apple store there, uh, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. There may be a Windows store there soon. Yeah, uh, very well could right. be. Yes. Yeah. But um, right. I guess we're going to be building a lot more stores. Well, we'll see. There's we'll see if they bring one to Hawaii. I'm sure they probably will. Yeah, me and my eight hundred dollar a month Internet that I want to get five megs up on. Uh <sighs> Something's got to give, guys. I, I, you know, I hear all these. Oh, I've got twenty-five megs up and twenty, hundred and two down. I'm on FiOS. I'm paying eighty-three dollars a month. I'm like, 
Yeah, definitely. If I ever leave Hawaii, the number one thing will be where I live, wherever I move into, it will have to have some good connectivity. And the house will be worth more if it does. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it should be a selling point. Fios available in this neighborhood. You know, that's an extra, for me, that's worth an extra 10 grand. Okay, guys. Well, uh, we're way long here. Thanks for hanging out with me. Andy, where can they find you? Okay, you can find me at rvnn.tv. And Rob? I uh, can be found, you know, on Twitter at, at Rob Greenlee. Uh, I've got my own blog at uh, robgreenlee.com and uh, probably a good place to check is zooninsider.com. Folks, if you got comments on today's show, geeknews at gmail.com. Of course, we'll be back here every Saturday morning that I'm in Honolulu, and uh, hope you enjoyed the show today. We'll be on a little later with the with the Chrome Show. Don't forget that Robot Underpants is uh, released every Monday, and then of course Geek New Century is every Tuesday and Friday, and then of course we have the Gadget Professor every Thursday. So we've got five to six hours of great content for you every week at Geek New Central. Make sure to geeknewcentral.com and check out all our shows. Get subscribed up. And that way you'll never miss any of our great tech content. Till next time, everyone take care and aloha.